Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And today with me, I have Carlo and Dylan from All You Can Board. Hey guys, how's it going? Good. Going great, yeah. Cool. So All You Can Board, All You Can Board, for those who don't know, is going to be a YouTube channel. I'll have a link down below. You can check out the stuff. Uh, you want to tell everyone what it is you and your channel, the types of videos, content, all that? Sure, yeah. We, we cover a whole bunch of different stuff. We do a lot of how to plays, reviews. We cover a lot of Marvel Champion stuff. Carlo's been uh, dabbling into Keyforge. Um, he also... Uh, uh, he got inspired by your videos. He's been doing a uh, curating his collection. He's done one video so far. Um, I think the other one's coming out soon, Carlo. Yeah, definitely. Uh, hopefully in the next few weeks. We'll see. Oh, nice. And, and just to be clear, why is only why only one of you curating your collection? Uh, I guess that'd be a good question for Dylan. Uh, yeah, I, especially because my collection is massive at this point. I guess it's because I haven't run out of shelf space yet, but I'm getting pretty yeah. close. So at some point, I'm going to have to. I have no choice soon. So how long have you? Uh, how long have you been in the hobby? Uh, I, I like actively collecting games. I would say it's been about five years, six years, maybe. But before that, I was playing like the odd game I had, like, you know, I had Pandemic and I had, um, you know, just a couple games kicking around. I think Carlo has been in it longer than me. Um, but, uh, maybe by a few years is like how long Carlo for you? Well, I, I got really into it with Carcassonne and Settlers of Catan, probably around like 13 years ago or so but i i played like the same five or six games for like almost a decade uh like 100 plus games of agricola and stuff until i kind of started branching out so i would say more into it kind of same like five six la uh, years maybe more recently gotcha yeah for me i started creating my collection totally not the point of this video by the way but i started creating yeah. my collection roughly i want to say three four years in the hobby when i finally ran out of room and i was like i can't have everything uh so yeah, yeah. it is a process for everyone will start it or not start it at different points and then i know people who have like five thousand games who never started and never will start it <laughs> but that is yeah. neither here nor there uh the point of this video this video if you saw the title already is top 10 games in the top 200 that we really feel we need to play, should play, want to play, any combination or factors they're in, uh, and basically just that. We, we This is actually, for those watching, this is our second video we've done together. The first one had a horrible echo due to a technical error on my side, and rather than doing the same list again, we decided we'll do something different, <laughs> and this is uh, that video. So, to that end, uh, I guess I'll go ahead and start us off with my number one, which is going to be, or number 10, my number 10 counting down, coming in at 191 on Board Game Geek. Tyrants of the Underdark is a game that I already own. In fact, most of these games I think I already own. Maybe all? Maybe all of these games I already own. We'll go through them as we go. <laughs> but Tyrants of the Underdark is a game that I, it's in the top 200. I really want to play this one. This is a, a deck building game with a board. I love deck building. I love deck building with a board. I haven't kept every deck building with a board game I've played, but I think I've liked all of them. Uh, Tyrants of the Underdark is going to be from... I think it's a D&D &D theme. It's from uh, Wizards of the Coast, I want to say. Publisher Gale Force 9 plus three more. Uh, Wizards of the Coast should be somewhere there, I believe. Yeah, Wizards of the Coast over there is going to be a publisher for them. And this is, yeah, it's deck building with a board. That's all I know. All I know is every time I talk about games like Dune Imperium, <laughs> Lost Dunes of Arnak, I get people who are like, ooh, did you play, did you play Tyrants of the Underdark? And I, that, my answer every time is no, I haven't. But I really like that genre of game, and I, I feel like I should be giving this one a shot at some point. And so that's why I both own it and uh, want to play it. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know a lot about this one. I'm looking it up now as you're mentioning it, and it uh, looks really, really cool, and I'm a huge uh, deck builder fan, especially, like, again, with the board. I, it's one of the reasons I love uh, I love Clank so much. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's super, super interesting to me. But, yeah, I'd never heard of it until you just mentioned it. Yeah, top 20 is mm -hmm. 7.9. It's highly rated, been around. It got one expansion, I believe, uh, never really developed from there. I have heard, actually, I think I recently heard, let me check the forums, forums will probably say, I've heard there's a new version coming out, but I'm not sure. Finally reprint over here, mm -hmm. one month ago. There's a reprint, second edition coming. I'm not sure of the details. Of course, I own the original and haven't played it, but yeah, it's coming out, so now's a good time to be paying attention for it. All right, on. Okay, and awesome. your number, oh, and speaking of which, are you guys doing uh, two different lists or a combined list? What were you doing? No, we're doing a combined list. Uh, okay. We just kind of each made our own separate lists, and then we kind of compared. And if there was any games that were just on one of our lists, we kind of scrapped them. So this is a, sort of the 10 that we see most eye-to-eye -eye on, I gotcha. would say. And so what yeah. is going to be your number uh, 10? Or yeah, maybe? starting with number 10 is going to be Food Chain Magnate. Uh, so that's pretty high on the list. It's a 31 on the BGG uh, all-time list. Um, the biggest reason for us to have this one on the list, I think, is that we haven't played any Splatter games yet. Um, you know, we hear such good things about, uh, you know, antiquity and uh, Indonesia and um, all these other games. And Food Chain Magnate seems to be the one that gets uh, kind of the highest praise. Um, we also, I would say neither Dylan and I have played a ton of these like really heavy economic games. Um, 
I just love the idea of this company that's making these really kind of niche games with limited uh, print runs that have like really high level of strategy and they're apparently really brutal punishing games. Um, it's just one of those games, I don't know anyone who owns it, um, and I know it's a fairly expensive game, so, I mean, one day I'd love to try it, but I just, I haven't really come across it, um, but yeah, it's one I've heard a lot about, and I definitely want to try it soon. Yeah, it's a solid one. You mentioned the only three slaughter games I've played, Indonesia, Antiquity, and Food Chain Magnet. Okay. Uh, from those three, Food Chain Magnet is easily my favorite, uh, although I do need to play Antiquity again. I've only played Antiquity once, but yeah, Food Chain Magnet is easily my favorite so far. It, it's an incredibly heavy system. It's one that I ranked this like in my number three game of all time at one point. It has gone mm -hmm. down since then only because it is so mentally exhausting when I play it that I don't always want to play it. I have to be in the right frame of mind. I have to have not be off of a long day. It is basically homework, but it's such rewarding <laughs> homework. It's so much fun to yeah. outmaneuver your opponents in this game, but it is mentally taxing to to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, is it so like, I'm curious then, so like, how many times do you think you have to play it before you're like comfortable with it and you're like, okay, I, I get this now? So, I mean, I get this now is a very different term than, it depends what you mean by that. So so for me, I think half a play is what you need to do before you reset and start again. Uh, getting mm -hmm. it, maybe three plays, maybe four plays, doesn't take a long time to get it, but there's a difference between getting it and having your opponent sidestep you with different strategies and tactics to outmaneuver you in this game. You're like, oh, I understand how important the milestones are. And then you jump into your second game and that's great but understanding how important the milestones are won't save you from you launching into a heavy burger and pizza production and having your opponents undercut you by littering ads for drinks all over the place while increasing and ramping up their drink production and then you're like oh great i got that strategy i know to counter it and sure that's great but now they jumped into undercutting you on certain milestones while building up a staff of waitresses and slowly putting their restaurants in with key advantages and lowering the prices to undercut you that way there's so many different ways to respond and reply to different people yeah. that it's not so much about getting the game game as it is about getting all the moves and counter moves in this basically uh, economic warfare style game right yeah no, that makes sense yep. you sound like you have played this game and you know it very well <laughs> <laughs> very well is relative i only have i think i have <laughs> under 10 plays in my belt probably around eight or nine plays of this under my belt it's it's a lot of fun and it doesn't take that many plays before you start figuring out those moves and whatnot i do recommend learning it or playing with people who are new to it for the first time or alternatively if you can't do that if you're playing with someone who knows the game make sure they're not a jerk that's basically it make sure they're not a <laughs> yeah. jerk meaning they have to Fair walk enough. in knowing that they their, their goal is not to win at that game their goal is to teach you and ease you into the system uh, and i do recommend that learning game you do it's, it's like it'd be a three or four hour long game playing it for the first time and then kind of being locked in when you clearly had no idea what was going to happen playing that hour and a half long game is worth the investment mm, okay. yeah well cool my number oh i don't own one of them my number nine this is the one that i don't currently own. that's not true i do own it i got it like two weeks ago i forgot about that pandemic legacy season zero Pandemic Legacy Season Zero is a game that's in the top 200 because 179, coming in at 179. My or my list is ranked uh, highest to lowest in terms of where they are in the top 100, top 200. Uh, so coming in at 179 is Pandemic Legacy Season Zero. Coming in at 8.7, which is pretty well rated. Uh, actually, I'm curious, what is Pandemic Legacy Season 1 rated as? I don't even know. I'll have to go look at it later. But in any case, uh, but either way, they uh, this is one that... It is the third game in the Legacy and Pandemic Legacy system. Don't let that zero confuse you. It's the third one in the system. And I've played one and two multiple times, actually. I've played one twice and two twice. I've enjoyed them both times. And now I'm time for Pandemic Legacy Season Zero, which I have not yet tabled. But I do need to get this out and play with my wife. It is a game that we have enjoyed the systems. We're looking forward to this one. It was an easy choice. As soon as I saw this one, I was like, well, of course I have to play this one. I've loved one and two to the point that I played them twice, which is, for a Legacy game, is pretty, pretty decent. Uh, but overall, I don't know much about this one. I know it was different i know that most people had pretty positive praise about the system and the the differences they brought to the table i know i've seen some people who are like a little bit less impressed with it but i think all around i've seen pretty positive feedback so i'm excited for my play of this cool yeah pandemic legacy season one is one of my uh best gaming memories uh, like i played it over the course of uh a I'd say like 11 to 12 months um slowly going through it and just loved every minute of it and i have season two and haven't got played it yet but it's one of those ones that because carlo hasn't played um pandemic legacy yet um that i'm gonna try to convince him to to sit down and do a session over a long period of time of season two but then i don't know if you, well, you want to do that if you haven't played season one so well here's and here's what i was gonna say is alex has the fact that we have an actual real life global pandemic happening uh <laughs> Deterred you or been part of the reason why you haven't played this yet? Uh, not in the slightest, no. It, no? It, okay. It's 
So a few different things there. So first of all, as a side, uh, Pandemic Legacy Season 0 seems to be rated the highest, coming in at 8.7, versus Pandemic mm-hmm. Legacy 1 is 8.6, and Pandemic Legacy Season uh, 2 is 8.1. Uh, BGG ratings are a combination of height and popularity, so it just means there's more ratings across the others. So, so far, it seems to be rated pretty decently. Uh, as far as the gener- as far as far access points, because you mentioned that, my intro to the series was Pandemic Legacy Season 1. Uh, my wife's intro point was Legacy Season 2. And so she and then she's played one since then. So it hasn't deterred our enjoyment of the game by jumping in at various points. We both like the games, although we do have different preferences. I like season one better. She likes two better. Uh, past that, in terms of my interest in the game, uh, the global real life pandemic, while obviously serious and very big deal, is so far abstracted to me from what these games are doing that it doesn't turn me off in a way and in fact if anything uh sales of pandemic in general have gone up during the pandemic you might think that right. they've gone down but they've actually gone much higher they went out of print for a while it's been harder to get this game and the prices have gone up because people are it's like more real to a degree this is a completely abstracted thing that we're like oh we're moving around a board oh look we're containing the disease it was so far removed from our lives and now there's like more of a, a seriousness of oh no we actually need to take this seriously because diseases are a real thing that could actually spread. So it, it, it could, I could see people being turned off by the theme during a pandemic, but I think for me, if anything, it makes it more intriguing. Granted, as long as it's abstracted and everything else, it's not real, but it makes it more intriguing. But yeah. Okay, yeah. No, fair enough. Cool. You're number nine. All right. Our number nine is uh, Raw from uh, Reiner Knizia. So this is uh, 180, I believe, on the uh, top 200. Um, so it's no secret, uh, Carl and I are big uh, Reiner Knizia fans. We play a lot of his games. Um, some of our favorite games are Knizia games. Um, and uh, specifically, we love ones that are, you know, have a generally simple rule set or, uh, you know, gameplay mechanics, but have this deep level of strategy and just something that draws you back multiple times. And you're, you know, discovering new things each time, but also just getting into, like, the, the true strategy of it with, you know, with some of his two player games like Lost Cities, for instance, that me and Carla come back to and just feel like we're getting better and better at them and just uh, absolutely love the mechanics, even though they're very simple. So, yeah. um, you know, this is one of his earlier games um, and we haven't played it. And I've heard so much about it that I feel like it's um, a crime that we, you know, claim to be Canadian fans that haven't played this one. <laughs> uh, so that's the main reason it's on this. But it's also just I, I like auction and bidding games and, and I don't play an, enough of them. But every time I play one, I realize how much. I enjoy that mechanic and and that dynamic in uh, a board game. So pairing uh, auction and bidding with Reiner Knizia just seems like uh, an obvious win. And I know I'll like it. I'm just more curious to to see where it's going to slot in compared to some of his other titles, like the ones that I really love, like Quest for Eldorado and and My City and Babylonia um, are all ones that I love of Knizia. And I'm curious how this one's going to slot in and rank with those ones. Uh, I'm not necessarily doubting that I'm going to like it. But uh, yeah, this that's... is a complete tangent. But Babylonia is new, right? Yes. How is uh, that? Fair, well, 2019, yeah. Yeah, 2019. How is that one? I've heard good things. Babylonia is really good. Carl, that's one Carlo owns, and he introduced to me, and I didn't know anything about it. And uh, yeah, it uh, it's one of it's the same type of Kinesia t- uh, mechanic where you start playing and you think like, okay, I understand the mechanics, like this seems simple, and then all of a sudden the strategy kicks in and you realize what you have to do to to deny your opponent or to try to get points, and the the genius kind of comes up from underneath the surface and. It, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a very, very good game. And I, I, the more I've played Babylonia, the more I realize it's one of my favorite Kinesia games. Awesome. Cool. And Quest for Eldorado, I love that one. It's a great deck builder. It's, yeah, lots of speaking of deck builders with the board. Uh, for Ra, Ra is excellent. It's one that I eventually got rid of because I had my collection for, I want to say, six or seven years. It, it's a solid, solid game. It's, it's the distilled auction mechanic that it, it really, really is incredibly well done. Uh, for myself, over seven years i found it wasn't different enough so eventually i got rid of it and moved on from it but speaking of crimes that you haven't played it uh, the amount of comments that felt it was a crime that i was getting rid of it uh, they definitely people wanted raw to stick around and it's a solid game uh, this is a good I, I can easily recommend this one to to anyone who likes auction mechanics it is the purest auction game that i have seen done well from like a longer not like a short card game uh, it really does a mm-hmm. solid job yeah good choice yeah yeah cool my number eight is going to be a game that 
people are going to uh, be interested by because number eight for me is this war of mine coming in at 149. Mm -hmm. And I say people are going to be interested by because I put this on a list of top 10 worst games. Granted, I had not played this games, uh, but I put it on a list that of, of here are all the reasons why I don't want to play this war of mine. I have, why I have no interest in the theme and the, the game and any of that stuff and, and why it's completely just not for me. And the amount of comments I got telling me that I should be playing it and talking about its brilliance and talking about what an emotional game it was and what a solid game. This War of Mine effectively is a game that in which you're dealing with a war-torn aspect of trying to survive doing a war, making hard choices, rationing your supplies, dealing with whatever goes on. And it's a game that, to me, from what I've seen about it, is all about punishment. It's all about the pain, the suffering. It's all about not actually winning. And I don't like that in games generally, but the amount of people that spoke up for this game, the amount of people that seem to be passionate about this game, I decided that I have to get my hands on a copy just so I can try it and then either be wrong or say, no, this is not a game for me. Uh, so either way, I did acquire it, have not yet played it. It will hopefully hit the table at some point, but this war of mine, it's a game in the top 200 that I have to play just because. Yeah, I, uh, I'm familiar with, I haven't actually played, but I'm familiar with the, the uh, video game that it's based off of. Um, but my the question I had for you is, have you played, because um, it's by Awakened Realms, have yep. you played Tainted Grail? I have not. It's on my shelf right behind me over here, but I have not played it yet. Okay. Yeah, so Tainted, it's, it, it's, I've been wanting to play this game for a while too, this war of mine, because I'm hearing it. But I have I have uh, mixed feelings on Tainted Grail. I know I'll get some flack for that because a lot of people love the Tainted Grail. And I wanted to love it and I've struggled to. But it's made me hesitant to go uh, play this war of mine because I, I don't want to be disappointed by how much my hype is as well. Because I've wanted to play it for a while and, I'm, and I don't want it to be brought down. But uh, but yeah, so I was just curious if you would play Tainted Grail so I can get an idea of you know your thoughts there and how they might compare to this one. Yeah, sadly not yet. But we'll get to it eventually <laughs> lots of things i need to yeah. get to cool yeah what's your number eight our number eight is inish coming in at number 107 on the list um this is one that we've known for a while we have to play um it kind of we were kind of on the fence a little bit between this and uh blood rage is that kind of level of area control game that we haven't played ultimately inish um won out a little bit which if I'm not mistaken, I think you'll be upset with Alice because I think you rank Blood Rage higher. But it, they're uh, so close, I can't fault you. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think there's something about uh, not only the art style, but the the card drafting system. Where and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe you're you have a set of cards and you're playing one secretly, and then everyone's revealing them, and then you kind of have an idea of which cards certain players have or haven't played, and what's kind of out there. Not really. Um, you you draft the no. cards from a common pool. There's gonna be 17 cards in a round, assuming a four player game. You're gonna draft them all to each end up with four, and then you just the cards are your actions. It's not like a game where the you take okay. actions and you augment that with cards. The cards literally define everything you could do in the game uh, you do play them right. sequentially though doing one at a time to go through that system okay yeah and i remember hearing about the the, the three different win conditions uh something along with the number six with like a, yep. like six leaders in a region or the 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 to the i don't remember what they're called the sanctuaries or whatnot yep. so there's a lot of little cool things going on the art is really intriguing it's just one of those like big area control ones with minis that we've always heard is like a must play game. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say a bad thing about Inish. Um, and yeah, it's it's just one we've got to play. Yeah, I like this one. This is, uh, I, I like Blood Rage a bit more, but Inish gets to the table more often just because of how accessible it is. It plays in a shorter time and it's a little easier to jump into, but it makes you feel so clever as you choose what to draft, as you play out the round, as you wait and hedge and pause so that, to wait till the end turn so you can try to sweep in for the win. Lots of solid things going on in Inish and yeah, solid, solid game. Cool. Nice. My number seven is going to be Decrypto. Decrypto, coming in at 104 on Board Game Geek. I think this is the last one I have that's outside the top 100. But Decrypto is a party game that I've heard is better than Codenames by, from a lot of people. And it's a game that I, again, I own this one. I haven't had the chance to actually get it to the table. I've read the rules multiple times, just never actually got played. Uh, our family, our game group, our every everyone we play with just likes Codenames as a game. We love the system of Codenames. It's an elegant party game that involves trying to come up with this, a system of clues that work with a combination of words to get that end result. And Decrypto has the same aspect, although with team 
gameplay where you're trying to decrypt your opponent's clues. The opponents have to give your clues and they have to be vague enough that combined with your your the, your hidden information, you hopefully will get there faster than your opponents. But if your opponents can figure out what you're going for, if your opponents can decrypt your clues before you, then they can effectively steal the win, so to speak. And so that's basically what Decrypto is doing. It has that code name aspect of trying to combine things in different ways that are clever while being different enough in what it's doing that I've just heard a lot of people say a lot of positive things about this game and I, I just need to get it played. Yeah, you know what? I actually have this one on my shelf as well. I got it about a year ago, and then obviously pandemic and stuff. Um, I, I haven't been able to get it to the table, but it, it looks awesome. Yeah, yeah, and call it saying better than code names is a bold is a bold call. So, because so, I'm a huge yeah. code names fan, I so wonder, I'm really I'm really curious. Code names in Board Game Geek is going to be uh, let's see, it's a seven point six, and it's ranked ninety seven. Uh, Decrypto, mm. I think, is coming in at a seven point eight. Let's see, Decrypto. Where were we? Just go back a screen. So if we go back to my other page. Uh, Decrypto is coming in at a 7.8, but ranked uh, 104, which means it's ranked higher mm -hmm. by slightly fewer people. That's what effectively yeah, means. Yeah, very close. Yeah. yeah. I remember hearing, too, that people said there's a bit of, like, for, for a party game like this, that it takes maybe a play or two to get the rules, or that, like, reading the rules isn't enough. You kind of just have to play it. So I think the same as you. I read the rules a couple times, brought it out, and then we just kind of never got to playing it. And then, yeah. Cool. Could be. Yeah. Okay. What's your number seven or six? Uh, six. Our... Seven. 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 That's the one. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Our number seven is uh, Great Western Trail. So this is actually pretty high on the list. Uh, uh, it's ranked 11 on Board Game Geek. Um, it's one that there's been multiple times where I've almost put this into my cart uh, on like doing some online board game shopping and stuff. I've been wanting to play this for a long time. Um, it's an Alexander Pfister game, and honestly, the only Alexander Pfister game I think I've played is Isle of Sky. There's, you know, Maracaibo and Cloud Age that are, I've both been wanting to play for a while, but I feel like I want to play Great Western Trail first just because of how, um, you know, the, all the positive reception for it and how much people talk about it. Um, it's, it's obviously a heavier experience, and that's been, you know, part of the factor in deciding to get other games over this one is just... I have to be selective with my heavier games because I don't yeah. play them as much as, as some of my smaller games. But um, there's just a lot of things I, I find really interesting about this. It's like, you know, you're obviously travel, traveling the Great Western Trail and and uh, herding cattle. For, I think it's from like Texas to Kansas City or something. Um, and you're uh, you like using buildings along the way and you end up being able to like, uh, I think, build your own buildings and you're hiring staff and, and, and all this stuff. Um, but it's just like, I know it's a game I know I'm going to like, but I know it's going to take some uh, a few plays to really wrap my head around, and I'm going to have to do the same thing with some other people to introduce it to them. But once that's done, you know, if me and Carlo both are completely, um, you know, understand the rules and have played this game a bunch, I, I can see it being one that we're going to want to play multiple times with people. But it's just one for a lot of different reasons. It's just stayed off our shelf. But hoping to fix that really soon because it's, uh, yeah, obviously a really popular game. Yeah, and first of all, if I was to look at the screen, this is not what the retail version looks like at all. This is someone who <laughs> really cares about Great Western Trail. Uh, but it's a good time to wait because they have that new uh, print coming out, apparently, from, from Plan B Games, I believe. They're, they're doing a new version of the right. game along with yep. two sequels at some point. So it's a good time to jump in. Like I'm I'm tempted. I believe the small changes, I'll be paying attention to what the, game, what the changes are because Great Western Trail, for me, is a game that I really enjoyed but also didn't keep. But it's like one of those games that's right on the cusp that small changes or even improvements to the quality, the art, whatever it is, could be enough to push it over. It really is a solid game. It's not overly complicated. It has a decent amount going on, but the actual sequence of play it really just comes down to moving around, taking the action on location, a little bit of deck building, a little bit of manipulation, a little bit of trying to figure out what the scoring objectives are, but it's not that heavy, all things considered, but it's a solid It's a solid design. It's a solid design. Cool. Yeah, and the, the sequels, I think, uh, just for to note, are, I think, Argentina and New Zealand, apparently, are coming in the next couple of years as well. Mm -hmm. Argentina has a big cattle industry. I didn't know New Zealand did. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. My number six, apparently, is going to be Dominant Species coming in at 73, a big little 30-point jump there. Coming in at 73, Dominant Species is going to be a game that I really need to play. Uh, this is from 2010, and again, I own this one. I think I own most of the ones on this list, uh, but <laughs> it, it, it's... It, this is, I mean, this is supposed to be, if this is from GMT Games, I hate their rule books, but they have some solid games. Uh, this is one where it's all about the evolution of your species, but effectively it's 
uh, evolutionary warfare. It's really about like this area control. It's really tense and, and pushing and attacking each other uh, in this game as you try to build and develop your species and their competitive advantages. Everything I've heard about this game makes me think it is 100% a game for me and my group. I, I finally got it, but I only finally got it when Pandemic started, when COVID started. And so we haven't, for when I when I got it, we were complete shut down. We didn't have any game group for that like three, four month period. And even as things slowly opened up, we haven't had a chance to really get this to the table. But the amount of good things I've heard about this game it's, I mean, it's it's been in the top 100 for a long time. It's a 7.8. They just recently came out with Dominant Species Marine. I think this game should be right up our alley. I think this is the kind of game we'll play, we'll love, we'll appreciate it, but also just we need to play it. That's part of the problem. Yeah, it's uh, it, this is one I've heard about multiple times, and again, because of the Marine version that just came out as well, but I honestly don't know a lot about how it plays, so I'm more curious to... to, to find out than I am to be able to put it on a list like this. It's just more curiosity for me at this point. Yeah. Very good. New number six. Our number six is El Grande. So that's at number 82 on the uh, BGG Top 100. And uh, honestly, this is one that we almost played over Tabletop Simulator uh, during the pandemic. I've read the rules to this a couple times. I was making a hard push to get this played. Um, it seems like the kind of, I mean, it's from 1995, so same year as uh, Settlers of Catan, um, just a classic area control game. Um, and, okay, one thing I'll mention for anyone who doesn't know, Dylan and I are Portuguese, so the, even just the fact that the game is kind of set in Spain, you see Portugal on the map on the edge, uh, That there's a little bit of that appeal to me, although uh, I do have a small issue with the fact that Portugal is... From what I remember, either the territory is worth nothing uh, or something like that. There's something where, like, because the, the game is about Spain, but Portugal is just kind of there. And I think there's something where when you control Portugal, you don't actually get anything. So uh, personally, a little bit offended by that. But otherwise, uh, I like the the idea of the Castillo, too, where you're dropping the, the cubes into the little, basically, tower. Yeah. Um, and you got to kind of keep track of how many cubes are in there for the part where it's revealed. Um, just the idea, too, of, like, the, the actions that are on the cards. You're basically picking from the cards that are face up and then that it determines what your action is um just seems like there's a lot going on that um like for a relatively simple rule set and i like i like um uh sorry what's his name uh, wolfgang kramer's games quite a bit um i haven't played as many of his that he's designed on his own but uh just recently renature from 2020 uh with him oh. and kiesling is amazing um yeah, he's done six nymphs and a bunch of other games, but uh, yeah, El Grande. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure you've played it, Alex. Yeah, El Grande is incredible. It's a really, yeah. really. I have the big box. It's I haven't actually played most of the expansions, but the game is so, so solid. It's it's pure elegant area control in all its forms. Uh, the card play is a ton of fun. The the track in the Casio is the one thing I would say I don't like. It's like it, it adds a memory element to the game, so people who are actually paying attention. So I don't love that aspect of the game. Uh, the rest of it though, it, it's such an elegant manipulation engine. It, it is it's one that I at some point I should do a review on this was a game that I grew to love well before I was doing content but it was yeah it, it, El Grande is incredible it, it, it's it's really really good at what it does and there's a lot of expansions and stuff in that big box to mix up the play mm -hmm. to keep it fresh forever if you actually needed to well, yeah, I've been trying to buy this for years, and it's obviously been out of print and out of stock everywhere. And uh, even when buying or looking to use, I'm always unsure if uh, the base game would be enough, or do you think it's worth it to go for the big box? I mean, I own the big box, and we've played this dozens of times, and I have not ever touched the expansion. I just haven't felt the need to. It's okay. one of those things I, I, I should really read the rules and see, oh, maybe this will add that, because sometimes I've, I've played expansion stuff, and it makes it so good. But other times, I generally don't dabble at the expansion stuff until I'm feeling that little bit of... Well, do I want to play El Grande? No, I want something different. That's when I pull up the expansion. When I want, when I feel yeah. a little bit bored of the base, is usually when I look into expansion content. But I, I have it all, and I haven't, I haven't, I think I've read one of them about how they work, and I think it's a clever little addition. I just haven't felt the need for it. Okay. Yeah, yeah base game does more than enough. Yep. Yeah. That said, the base game, because they primarily sell the big box nowadays, I believe, the base game, I think the original base game, isn't that much cheaper than the big box. It depends on where you find it or whatever it is. But I think they, okay. I think they primarily reprinted uh, the big box. Cool. Excellent choice. My number five is going to be Anachrony. Coming in at 45, coming in at 8.1 from Mind Clash Games. I own this game and I really need to play it. I've heard so many good things. Again, goes back to Pandemic. I, I got this at the beginning of COVID. I read the rules. I was all prepped to play it, waiting for the rule to reopen, and it just didn't reopen for a long time. And it's a game that does have a solo mode, a great solo mode, and people have told me to try it, but I don't want to 
walk into my first game with my game group with me having played a game and having that much more of an edge over them I, I want to kind of experience it together with them and jump into it it's a game about time travel to an extent it's a game where you borrow resources from yourself in the past to do what you need but then you have to you borrow resources from yourself in the future to do what you need but then you have to pay it back you have to basically go return those resources or suffer issues with the timeline or the the, the, the constraints uh, mind clash games is known for heavy games and this is one that i'm intimidated by getting it to the table but i really really need to at some point because i mean it's an 8.1 it's ranked 43 on board game geek it, everything about the game should be a game that appeals to me i just like most of the games on this list need to get it played yeah, this was one that actually was in the conversation for us and we almost uh, considered putting it on our list because for a lot of the same reasons. Again, I don't even know that much about how it plays. I just, the the theme is super attractive and that stuff you mentioned about time travel and boring resources from yourself in the past, like that kind of stuff is just uh, right away is it makes it a game I want to play. It just, um, it, one of those ones that I don't choose to go buy and I don't know anyone who owns. So at some point I need to play it. I just don't know when that's going to be, but yeah, completely agree with that, that, that inclusion. Yeah. Cool. Have you played uh, Tricarian or... Um, I haven't played any uh, of their games. Cerebria? None of their games. Okay, I, yeah. I really want mm -hmm. Tricarian. I, I, Cerebria doesn't really interest me for some reason. Tricarian, I really want to play. I want to get it, but I just haven't, uh, haven't taken over. I haven't gotten around to it yet. Sorry. Serbia, I don't have an interest in, and Tricarian, I have specifically held off on getting it because I can't justify getting all these heavy games that I'm not playing. Uh, games I want to play, but I haven't actually tabled yet. I have my own personal rule for Tricarian, is as soon as I play Anachrony, I'm letting myself get Tricarian. Until then, I'm holding off. Nice. Yep. Fair enough. Okay, and you're number five. All right, our number five is Root. So this is one that is on this list mostly because uh, it gets so much attention, so many people love it, and uh, we just we feel bad that we ha can't even be in the conversation uh, to play it. And we actually just got sent uh, Oath uh, from By Leader Games, nice. and so we're, we're going to end up be we're going to end up playing that before we play Root, which is probably uh, people are going to give us some flack for as well. But uh, yeah, it's just one that like we we know someone who has it. I've heard a lot about it, and I know a lot about how it plays and. Obviously, the asymmetrical aspect of it is a big thing, and and it gets you know a lot of people talk about the pros of that and the cons. Uh, I love the idea and and usually the execution of asymmetrical powers or factions and things playing differently because it you know encourages you to come back and and try a different faction and it feels the game feels like the game's different. And I and I've heard a lot about how root is you know, uh, you know. It's it's a big deal how different these factions play and and how you know playing this faction against this one makes it feel completely different and you know there's been some people saying that you know you do, you don't want to do this matchup or this one is unfair and don't include them and and things like that and I just I can't even comment on it because I haven't experienced this game so it's one that um, as soon as the the you know the we're able to meet with the larger gaming groups. I think this is one of the first ones that Carl and I are planning to to schedule a, a day to to play so we can finally have that experience and probably multiple plays for that matter. But yeah. uh, it's one that's just eluded us up to this point. I think Carlo, you considered buying it at one point. I think I considered buying it at one point. It's just been like a, a near miss every time. Carlo? Oh, yeah. And um, if I'm not mistaken, Alex, uh, I seem to remember that you had some mixed feelings on Root uh, in some previous videos sort of yours. Of. Uh, I know you like it, but you said, I can't remember if it was that you never wanted to play it again no. or that you recommended that other people don't play no, or no, some, no, something no, along those lines. Not that much. Are you putting words in your mouth? Uh, you're putting words in your mouth to a degree. I have, com I okay. have complaints Sorry. against Root. I think Root is a flawed game. Thanks. But it's a flawed game okay. that is incredibly good despite its flaws. And and this one, I actually, I actually play this one more because of COVID in a weird way. I actually played this one originally. I liked it. I got rid of it because of some of the flaws that I have with it. And then I got it back during COVID because once the world slowly started opening up, or once that first four or five months was over, we still kept very sheltered circles. But our game group of like 20 people went down to just four people. Four, and that was it. And then we, kept, we tried to keep everything minimized in that sense. But that meant I was playing with the consistent four people instead of the usual mix-up I was doing. And it led, that was what led me to get Root back, because one of my complaints against Root is, first of all, the teach of Root. Uh, teaching Root is going to be such a pain, because it's not that complicated, but it's a lot. You have to teach everyone every single different faction and how they play. And it just leads to so much extra work to get this game to the table. It's one that I played the first few times, way back when it, before I got it back, 
And then I just never played it again because as soon as I had to teach new people, I was like, I'm not spending an hour teaching you all these factions every single time I want to loop someone into the game. And so that, it, it was one of the flaws I had with it. The other complaints I have are things that you're kind of locked into playing your role. The IB has to do this to keep everyone in check. The cats have to do this to keep everyone in check. But then the you have to be careful of, of, of the vagabond or it's going to do this and this. You have to make sure not to do that and that and that. Everyone has their roles, their, their pre-scripted defined jobs that they have to play in this game that effectively make the base game of Root one that I have minimal interest in playing again by itself. One of the things that I do like about Root, though, is the introduction of expansions, of content, of all these other factions, and the near-infinite ways you can mix them up lends itself to it being less of a pre-scripted job, less of a role, because unless you're beyond expert at Root, you're not necessarily exactly sure how to play it out when it's the, the Ivy versus the Moles versus the Vagabond and then the Lizardfolk. That combination suddenly changed it. I have a whole bunch of complaints as to why Root is not a game that should be good, but ultimately I love it despite that. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. My number four. My number four is going to be Nemesis, a game that I actually don't currently have here, but I do own. I backed this one. I'm just waiting for my copy of it. Uh, Nemesis at 23 on Board Game Geek. It's number 23. That's insanity to me. This is a game that continues to grow every single time. It's one that people complain about, talk about how flawed it is as well. Speaking of flaws and complaints with games despite, and loving it despite that, Nemesis seems to constantly fall into that category. The amount of people I've heard talk about how unbalanced it is or how luck-driven or how people will get each other's ways or different things will happen along the way and yet despite that people seem to love the story that generates as you play it you're trapped in a spaceship one of you may be an alien you may be aligned you may be not aligned you all have your own secret goals you're all trying to vie for whatever strategy you need understanding that you have to escape the aliens on the board and one of you may actually be helping the aliens along the way there's a ton going on in this game and it's awakened realms again this is actually my sec second entry from awakened realms on this list but nemesis is one that i have to get to the table at some point it's it screams of the theme alien it seems like it would be tense and fun and tactical to play this game although it's one that i'm walking into already resigned to the fact that it might not be about winning because of this that or tactical whatever it might just be about generating an incredible story and journey and just having a fun time as you play yeah this is one of those ones i feel like every time i hear about it it's either someone saying they absolutely love it or that they hate it or like you said there's some flaws so i'm it's one that's not maybe like at the top of my list to try but just based on how polarizing it is and like you said i didn't even know it was 23 on the 23. on the bg list but yeah. uh yeah that's that's nuts we, we definitely should try it at some point yeah it's what yeah this is good this is one that like I don't want to go by myself, but I want to go find someone who has it and just mooch it off of them and play a few <laughs> sessions with them because I, I definitely need to play it. But I, I just be based on what I've seen and what you've described. But again, it never really shows up my radar when I'm thinking of games I haven't played. Yeah, it's just, it's, a, it's a 23 that gets me. It's the rating that gets me. Initially, I'm more with you. Initially, I what I heard that polarizing, and I was like, I don't know. Maybe I should. Maybe I shouldn't. But it's a lot of money to jump into that maybe category. But, I mean, 23 is 23. That's a lot of people who, it seems like for every one person who hates it, there must be a good 10 that love it just by the rankings. So so I'll take that gamble. Yeah. Hmm. What's your number four? Our number four is War of the Ring. So this is another one that's real high up, number 13 on the list. Uh, I think the original came out in 04 and the second edition in 2012. So this is a heavy, like fairly heavy two-player only game. It's one of those ones that we've heard about ever since we kind of got into the hobby. Sounds like one of those really kind of legendary games. Um, we're, I wouldn't say we're like the biggest Lord of the Rings fans in the world, but we, we like Lord of the Rings quite a bit. We've seen the movies many times. Um, and just the idea of one player taking on uh, basically, you know, the, the free peoples against the... Um, Sar Sauron. Against Sar Sauron, basically, yeah. Um, I, I don't know a whole lot about how it actually plays out. I just know that it's playing like you're basically getting a bunch of the narrative and story arc of Lord of the Rings and going through these different battles in different regions of the map um and obviously trying to uh to get to mount doom but um yeah it's just it, it looks like one that i think if i was going to play it i wouldn't want to just try it once uh, i always keep hearing like oh find a player and play it with that same player playing the same factions each like at least two or three times and then maybe once you've each played then swap factions but um yeah it's just one of those ones it seems like it's going to be like you know quite an investment uh not only financially, but also just to get the time into play it and get the proper level of enjoyment out of it. But I know that once we do, it'll probably be a game we, we love and grow to really appreciate. Yeah, this one, uh, this is on my short. This is actually my 11th pick. I cut this one out at the last minute, but it's one that falls into that category as well. I, I, I know exactly as little or as much as you know about it. You know, it's a two-player game. It captures elements of the story. You could have Frodo wandering into Mordor or something. Who knows what? But, like, all these things... 
I, 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 unlike yourself, I've watched the movies a bunch of times. I tried reading the book. That was too much work for me. And I like books, to be very clear. I just, that was one book that I did not love. Yeah. But it, it's, yeah. yeah, this is one that I want to kind of get to a convention one time and then have someone teach me how to play it because I, I'm i intimidated by it. And the art does not pull me in. If you're, again, if you're looking at my screen, this is a deluxified version of the game you're looking at. This is not the standard game. So it's one that I'm not pulled in visually. I'm just pulled in by the promise of the story it may or may not deliver. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And can I ask you something, Alex? Uh, we actually we almost had Twilight Struggle on this list instead as kind of the other okay. like really heavy two player only game. I know they're not really that similar in how they play, but have you played Twilight? I Struggle? have played Twilight Struggle. Twilight Struggle, and one of the reasons why War of the Wing is not in my collection is because of Twilight Struggle and because of uh, Star Wars uh, Rebellion, which is I mm -hmm. have found that four hour long two player experiences no matter how much I like them practically speaking don't hit the table with my group uh, it's my wife and I don't really do games in four hours chunks and my game group was not really two people so I have found that practically speaking they're not a fit for my collection Star Wars Rebellion I thought was an excellent game that I got rid of because it wasn't going to get played uh, Twilight Struggle I have a few more complaints about I didn't love it quite as much I liked it a lot I found that the amount of dice rolling in that game is larger than I would like uh, I know people who are fans of the game will swear up and down to days or tomorrow but how no it's about management of the luck it's not luck it's an average is out over two rounds whatever it is I, I i like twilight struggle a lot i played it a lot but eventually i did move on from that one just uh, that one is a combination of the nature of i don't play four hour long two player games and the fact that i had a little bit of complaints about how the uh the dice rolling was such a large factor in the game but yeah it's a solid okay. game but i'm more interested, far more interested in war of the ring far more interested, just just thematically yeah. cool my number three is one that I debated not including on this list because I have played Gloomhaven, but I have not played Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, and it's so much more, uh, quote-unquote, important to me to play Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion because my biggest problem with Gloomhaven is I played it a few times when I first got it to just to determine that it was a game that I was interested in, and it has sat, sat at my shelf covered in dust since then because it's not a game I look forward to pulling out. It's just the amount of setup, the amount of work, the amount of accessibility in it is just not there. Uh, and so Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, in theory, aims to fix that giving you a shorter Gloomhaven, 25 missions or whatever it is, something along those lines, and a, a setup that is much more streamlined and then cutting out a bunch of the extra rules, but not, not in a way that dumbs down the game. I mean, this is an 8.8 .8 on board. You think this is ranked the sixth highest, which is insane for a compressed, condensed version of Gloomhaven. But it's one that I think I really need to get this to the table just to see how I feel about Gloomhaven in general. Do I keep the original? Do I just play Jaws of the Lion? Do I even finish Jaws of the Lion? All these are questions I need to answer, but in order to do that, I need to play Jaws of the Lion, which is why, once again, like everything else here, it is on this list. Yeah, I actually just played... I mean, we, we've played a ton of uh, Gloomhaven over the, the past few years. We played through the entire base game and uh, Forgotten Circles, and then... Uh, during the pandemic, I actually played through Jaws of the Lion entirely solo, mm. um, nice. just uh, like two-handed, I guess, with Demolitionist and Hatchet. Uh, highly recommend those those classes when you do play. But uh, yeah, it's it's very you know there's it's obviously doesn't have the same like epic grand scale as Gloomhaven. There's not as many side quests. You don't have you don't you don't retire a character and take over a new one. You're stuck with the same character the whole campaign and that sort of thing. So there's a bit less to see. But yeah, if you're looking to get into Gloomhaven and experience that system, uh, Jaws of the Lion does such a good job of um, having a bit more of a condensed game and also making it easier for like newer players to get into. So yeah, it's it's an amazing achievement as far as uh, game design goes, absolutely. Cool. And you're number three. Our number three is the Board Game Geek number three, and that is Brass Birmingham. Ooh. So... We uh, again. This is this is on this list mostly because it's number three uh, overall, and we haven't played it. And to me, that is just we we need to see what all the fuss is about as well. And the other reason is uh, it's Martin Wallace, and we hadn't played I don't think any Martin Wallace games until we just received this year Rocket Men, um, and we did we did some content on that. And Rocket Men uh, was an interesting one because we we had such mixed feelings about it. Like so I kept feeling drawn to it and liking it, but there was aspects of it that I just felt were so punishing. And I know that that's a, an aspect of some of Martin Wallace's games. And so Brass is Brass Birmingham. I had never played the original Brass, and and this and Birmingham is obviously the one that people say you know re-implements in such a great way or it expands on in such a great way that I just I have to experience it to also just understand you know is it 
that Martin Wall schemes maybe just aren't for me? Was it just that one that maybe wasn't for me? You know, well, what's all the fuss with this one? Uh, it's an economic strategy game, and we don't play a lot of those, like Harlow mentioned before. So it's also just something to sort of expand our scope of some of the things we're playing and see, you know, whether they are for us or whether it's just because we haven't played enough of them. Um, it's just, it's, I'm drawn to it mostly because of the hype and the popularity, but also I think that there's going to be aspects of it that I just really, really enjoy in terms of the network building and, and, and all that, that I've done on a smaller scale in some games. This is obviously a heavier experience, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's number three. I, I, we have no excuse. We have to find a way to get it. And I assume you haven't played Lancashire either. No, have not. Yeah. Yeah. So I've played Lancashire. I love Lancashire. I own Birmingham. I need to get it played, but uh, Lancashire is incredible. I love Martin Wallace in general, though. So I haven't played Rocketman, but I really do love Martin Wallace's designs. Most of them, I find them very elegant and very tight, uh, very thematically tied to what they're doing as well. And, and they're some of the more some of the more rewarding games that I have played are definitely Martin Wallace designs. Yeah, and and I will say that regardless of my overall final thoughts on Rocket Men, the thematics, like you're saying, are he implements in a way that everything you're doing fits the theme that uh, that he's established. So I find that really, really inspiring. Yeah, great choice. My number two is going to be Twilight Imperium Fourth Edition. Again, I own this game. I think I will play it once and then get rid of it. Uh, I just think that's the. <laughs> I, I can't possibly keep a game that promises a six to eight hour play time. I just don't play games that way. Uh, maybe one day, but right now I don't. But at the same time, it's coming in at what is it? It's number five on Board Game Geek. It's a game that people talk about the epicness of this experience. There's no way I can't. You know, they talk about like all those jokes about turning in your gamer card. I feel the fact that I haven't played Twilight Imperium is a turning in your gaming card kind of game. It's one that I, I, I want to play it. It looks cool. Everything about the genre appeals to me. It's just the commitment, the time, and, and all of that that has not had me play in this game yet. I don't know when I'll play it. I, I don't know. Hopefully, at some point in my life, I will actually get this to the table. It's a big box, and it's certainly just taking up shelf space. But I really, I really want to play this epic 4X game that has just never been replicated to this scale and this degree of praise across the board. Yeah, it's this is one where like I also want to play it, and I, I would be a safe saying that I don't know if I ever will, only because it's going to take someone ha having it, being willing to teach me, and sit me down and say we're doing this on like a Saturday or whatever, and I'll happily do it. But you know, it's not one I'm going to go out and buy and 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 make the initiative there. But for a lot of the same reasons, I definitely want to experience it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you're number two. Our number two, uh, coming in at number 50 on the BGG list from Uwe Rosenberg, is Le Havre. So that is a 2008 game. Um, okay, where do I start? I mean, Agricola is, if not my favorite game of all time, definitely way, way, way up there. Uh, one of my most played games. Absolutely love it. Um, Le Havre is, uh, I guess, thing came out just a year after, um, is some pretty, I don't want to say mean work replacement, but it goes back to the worker placement from you know around that time where it was a lot more of interactive blocking people there wasn't as much you know a lot of more recent worker placement games have a lot of stuff where you can just go get similar resources somewhere else or you can go to the same space but you pay more workers or whatnot um, this has a very tight system you can buy buildings you can buy ships uh, that have upgrades that you use throughout the game um, it's just one of those ones that we've heard, like Dylan and I both are really big fans of Uwe Rosenberg, one of our absolute favorite designers. Um, there's some of his bigger games that we haven't played. Um, we haven't played like Caverna mm -hmm. and I think Ora et Labora. Um, there might be one or two others, but La Havre is the one for me that's highest up on the list of, of must play Uwe Rosenbergs that I haven't yet played. Um, and it's just one of those ones we, again, I read all the rules, was ready to teach it on Tabletop Simulator during the pandemic, and the game night kind of fell through, so I, I kind of even know how to play it, but I just, yeah, I haven't been able to get it to the table yet and don't know anyone who owns it. Yeah, Lav is my favorite Uwe Rosenberg design. Uh, I own a few of his games, I've tried a lot of his games, uh, I like all of his games, but I only keep some of them because they do often feel very similar in the general idea, yeah. like resource conversion, resource generation, what they do, they do well. And so Lav is one that it is my favorite from his, from his stuff. The, the the amount of reward you get as you try to build up the engine of I'm going to turn this into that, I'm going to turn this into that, I'm going to take an action going here, gathering all the stuff there. It's one of those games where everything you're doing is positive. Everything you're doing is more. It's just a question of who was able to do that more better than the other person. But I like that in games. I don't I don't jump into games, speaking of uh, this war of mine, I don't jump into games to feel punished. I jump into games to feel like I can do everything. And Lahav makes you feel like you can do everything. Yeah, solid choice. Yeah. And very different from the punishing uh, nature of, of Agricola. Yes, yes. There's no, there is feeding in this game, but it's much more minimal and much more tolerable. 
Okay. Cool. My number one is going to be the first and perhaps last, we'll see, crossover on this list of Brass Birmingham. Brass Birmingham, like you said already, coming at number three, I've played Brass Lancashire. I love Brass Lancashire. I think Brass Lancashire is incredible. And yet something about these games is there's a discrepancy here. If you look at the Board Game Geek, browse the top 100, and what do we have here? We have Brass Birmingham is going to be coming in at number three, and Brass Lancashire comes in at number, where are we? Somewhere down further. There we are, number 19. Now, by all accounts, it should be the reverse. By all accounts, Brass Lancashire, as a re-implementation of the original, should have more ratings, should have more hype, should have more people talking about it. And yet, Brass Birmingham apparently did something. I don't know what it is, but it did something to iterate upon that core design and improve upon it in such a way that there is a 16-point gap between these two games. So, uh, I should be playing it. I need to play this. I love Brass Birmingham. Why in the world am I not playing the supposed arguable better version of that game? So, so yeah, I absolutely need to play this one. Yeah, and it's interesting because, like, so I didn't mention it when I was talking about it when we picked it, but we... I I don't think either of us has played Brass or Brass Lancashire, mm-hmm. and I so I'm I, we'd be coming at it from the fact that this would be our first experience with Brass. In your opinion, do you think it, we, we should go into Birmingham, or do you think we should play Lancashire first? I can't even answer that. I haven't played Birmingham. I believe <laughs> I believe Birmingham adds some small things. So in terms of complexity, it might right. add stuff. I I don't get the impression that it adds much. I mean, arguably you could look at the game weights and see if there's any difference there. Uh, we have Brass Birmingham coming in at a game weight of three point nine one and Brass Lancashire coming in at 3.86. So yeah, there's a 0.5 difference there, but you're also looking at an 8.9 versus an 8.2. So that's a big, big jump in terms of the, uh, just look at that, 8. Sorry, 8.7. 8.7 instead of 8.2. That's a bigger mm-hmm. jump. I would risk yeah. the, the weight difference for that. Yeah. 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 Cool. And you're number one. All right, our number one is, uh, we cheated a little bit here, not really because it's a re-implementation, but uh, there are, we, we kind of have two games here, and what that is Terra Mystica and Gaia Project because they're very similar, and I think I am drawn a little bit more to Terra Mystica, Carlos is drawn a little bit more to Gaia Project, um, but we both want to play them both and have not. Now, Terra Mystica, I've honestly twice now been in a store and had it in my hand and ended up not buying it for a variety of different reasons that I convinced myself that I don't know why I did but it has it does so many things that I just know it's going to be a game I love uh, the 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 theme the fantasy and all the different races is something that I absolutely love in board games it's you know uh, games like uh, uh, Ethnos and Small World where you have these different uh, races or factions and they each have either their own abilities or things they do differently or ways you have to interact with them. I love that. And this one I think is like 14 different groups that, you know, each have a different, um, or a di- different ones have different home landscapes and they each uh, play a little bit differently. I love that in fantasy games. and I love being able to explore different races. It's just a, it's a genre I'm already, uh, already, or a theme I'm already drawn to. Um, the, you know, all the different, uh, hexagons on, on the board that you're, you know, doing, uh, you know, Upgrading, you're putting buildings down, upgrading your buildings. Um, each building is giving you different resources, you know, like whether it be dwellings giving you workers or, um, you know, trading houses giving you money and, and so on. Like there's everything that it does in, from a gameplay perspective, even without me knowing the full rules of the game, I know I'm going to love. It's just for whatever reason, I haven't got it to the table yet. And it's one that we've considered playing on online uh, through like, you know, whether it's Board Game Arena or Tabletop Simulator. Um, but I almost want to experience this for the first time with the physical version with four people around a table. Um, so this is one I can almost guarantee we're going to play. It's just a matter of when and hopefully it's going to be before the end of the year. And then uh, I'll let Carlo talk quickly about Gaia Project. Yeah, normally I would be uh, on the same side as Dylan in terms of like comparing the two games. Normally I would lean more to like a fantasy theme type thing than than space. Like even we're talking... Uh, like I, I like hero realms more than star realms. I tend to gravitate more to that side, but there's something about the table presence and the look of um, of Gaia Project and the fact that it's just the newer, like it's from what I've heard from people who've played both of them a lot. I know there are some people who still prefer Terra Mystica, but I've heard that there are things they've changed about the rules that apparently improve it for Gaia Project. I mean, I don't really know which one I ultimately like more, but uh, yeah, I lean a little more to Gaia Project. Yeah, Guy Project was another one that was on my short list for another game that I own. Terra Mystica is a game that I loved for, loved is probably a strong word. I liked and appreciated what Terra Mystica was trying to do. It wasn't one that ultimately stayed in my collection, but I liked enough of what it was doing that I had to get
a guy project because again a better iterated version of something that i was already on the cusp of like i said with great western trail that's something that is is interest me and so guy project was on my short list sadly it did not make this list but it's one that i don't love it's actually interesting because you talk about how you like the board look i actually far prefer the look of terra mystica in terms of the theme and the look on the board but it, it, this one supposedly i've heard enough good things about how they've iterated and made it a better system and with more powers and abilities and things like that that i'm very intrigued by it yeah solid choice cool great that has been our top 10 what is again top 10 in the top 200 games that we want to play or some title along those lines uh this has been fun thanks so much carlo and dylan for uh bearing yeah. with us hopefully this time it did work out uh with less <laughs> audio issues we shall see uh to everyone else uh, make sure to check out their channel i'll have a link down below until next time i'm alex i'm dylan and i'm carlo and have a good one